Our scripture reading this morning is again in in Matthew chapter 9. I'd like to read for you verses 35 through, I believe, verse 38. Yes, that's right. This is what we see again regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. May the Lord bless again His Word to our understanding this morning, and may He apply it to our hearts by His Holy Spirit. Now again, I've been emphasizing over and over again that uh, to know Jesus Christ means that His moral image is being formed in you. Now what that means is that everything that is true of Jesus Christ uh, really is becoming true of you at least in some degree. In other words, you have His heart by His Holy Spirit. You do love what He loves and you hate what He hates. Now what we've been looking at in this series is really how this works itself out um, in our lives by seeing how it worked itself out in His life so that you can see what the Spirit of God is actually doing in you. I mean, what it is that he wants to do, what he is aiming at. Uh, Remembering that growing into the image of Christ is not something he does by himself, but something we actually have to work together with him with. If you can see what he's doing, you can cooperate. You can yield. You can let him lead you in that direction to become more like Jesus Christ. Now, we see in this particular part of Scripture that as Jesus was going throughout the land of Israel, teaching and proclaiming the gospel and doing miracles, by the way, those miracles were not only meant to prove that He was actually bringing God's Word to them, I mean, that's the reason why He did them, one of the reasons, but they were also acts of mercy and acts of grace because He was moved with compassion for their their particular illness. But as he was going through teaching and preaching and doing these miracles, as he looked at the people, his heart was moved. Now again, you know, when the Pharisees looked at at the people, they despised them because they saw them as sinners. And Jesus Christ, you might think, might be tempted to do the same thing because who was more holy than he was and who could see sin more clearly than he could and who would, you know, be revulsed by it more than he would. I mean, he had every reason to be moved with anger towards these people, but actually he wasn't. Even though these same people would be the ones who would later reject him and who would hand him over to the Romans to be crucified, they were, for the most part, unconverted. And yet when Jesus looked at them, he didn't feel anger, he didn't feel revulsion, he didn't pull in, as it were, the the, the edges of his robe and say, you know, you're unclean, I'm not going to let you touch me. But rather, he was moved with compassion. Now, why was he moved with compassion? Well, he was because he was able to look beyond what they were like. He was able to look beyond how they might respond to him and what it is they would do to him in the future. And instead, he saw their need. We see in, in, uh, from Matthew's account, he saw the condition they were in. They were distressed. They were dispirited. They were troubled. They were discouraged. And why was that? Well, it's because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no spiritual guidance. Their leaders had neglected to feed them and to teach them the truth and to lead them in the ways of the Lord. Jesus, in pronouncing His his, basically his curses upon the Pharisees, the leaders of Israel, one of the things he says, you've, you've closed the kingdom of heaven to others. You won't enter yourself and you won't allow others to enter. These were the people who were leading and teaching the people that Jesus now looks at. They were using them for their own gain. And Jesus sees then what the result was 
But Jesus looked beyond their spiritual condition. He looked beyond, again, what it is that, that they were, you know, what they would do to him in the future. And he saw their need, and he was moved with compassion. He felt sympathy. He pitied them, and he wanted to do something for them. And again, it wasn't because of them necessarily. It wasn't because of any good thing he saw in them but rather it was because of his heart was full of love. Same, th same reason why the Lord chooses any. It's not because we're so beautiful. And it's not even because we're so much as in need, although I suppose you might say, yes, that is one of the main reasons, because it draws out God's love. It draws out His compassion. This is what happened with Jesus Christ. He saw them. His heart was moved with compassion to do something, and that's exactly what He did. He healed them. But more importantly, he ministered the gospel to them. But Jesus realized at the same time that, you know, his, his efforts weren't going to be enough. There were too many. He wasn't going to be able to reach them all. And not only that, but there were still many generations of people yet to come. And so he told his disciples, look, the harvest is plentiful. There are many who need to hear the gospel, but the workers are few. I mean, there's only few qualified and equipped to bring it to them. As a matter of fact, Jesus was the only one who was doing this while His disciples were with Him, while He was training them. And so Jesus said to them, you need to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray that He might raise up more workers, that He might send them out to reach those who are lost. In other words, Jesus was telling them that they should pray not only that the Lord of the harvest would equip them and use them, but that through their work, through their labor in the gospel, that there would be even more raised up to do this work. Because how does the Lord send workers into the harvest? They have to be saved. They have to be discipled so that they can do the work. Now, I'm sure you realize that what was true then is no less true today, perhaps it's even truer today, that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The Lord needs more laborers in the harvest. So this morning, I want us to consider three things. First of all, that there are many all around you who need to be reached with the gospel, but there still are few who are equipped and qualified to bring the gospel to them. And so you need to do what Jesus told His disciples to do even in, in that particular time frame. You need to pray to the Lord that He would use you and that through you He would raise up even more workers to labor in this harvest to do this work. So first of all, let's consider that there are many all around you who need to be reached with the gospel. Now, I, I really don't think I need to labor this point very long because obviously our country would not be in the situation that it is in. The world would not be in the situation that it is in if this were not the case. The vast majority of people in our nation, the vast majority of people in the world, the vast majority of people in this city and in your neighborhood do not know the Lord. As a matter of fact, I'd be so bold as to say even the vast majority of those who claim to be Christians aren't really Christians. They're not really true believers. Uh, you know, I don't know what the recent Gallup poll has to say about how many are, are laying claim to being Christians, but at one time it was 80%, and that was at a time when our nation was still in the condition that it is, and we've only gotten worse. Even most who claim to be believers are not true Believers, there are few people who have anything of Jesus' image and nature being formed in them. There's very few like Him. You know, the Bible basically tells us that everybody who knows Jesus Christ, and you really should listen to this, everybody who knows Jesus Christ is going to be made like Him. And so if you're not like Jesus Christ, if you're not being formed into His image, you don't know Him. Now, Jesus did remind us in Scripture that there are many are called, but few are chosen. 
and the path that leads to life is narrow, and there are few who find it. Now, again, I'm not trying to be ungracious, but this is simply the way it is. This is what our Lord Jesus Christ told us it would be like. But because there are so few that are saved, there are many who are in danger. Again, I don't need to remind you that, that anyone who dies without repenting of their sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ goes down into hell. And they have to face the consequences there of their sins. And their sins are not small sins. Their sins are sins against an infinitely holy God. So they have to face the consequences of those sins in hell forever. And the Bible says that once you were there, once you are in hell, there is no escape. So if someone is going to be saved, it has to be while they are still living. Death seals their condition. Now again, the only thing that God has done to save anyone is the work that He has done through His, through His Son, Jesus Christ. If anyone doesn't trust Jesus, if anyone doesn't repent of their sins, they won't be saved. I mean, that's true of you. That's true of everyone. You have to repent. You have to trust in Christ. But how can anyone repent? How can anyone trust if they don't hear the gospel? They need to hear the gospel. The simple message of what God has done to save through His Son. Now, does that mean that if they simply hear it, they're going to be saved? No, of course not, because... There are many people who are going to hear it and are going to reject it if the Lord doesn't have mercy on them. But one thing is certain, if they don't hear it, they certainly will be condemned. They will have no hope at all. And so, again, there are many around us who need to be reached with the gospel. Now, second, what compounds the problem is that there are so few that are qualified and equipped to bring this message to them. Only true believers, I think you, you'll understand, are really qualified to bring this message to them. And as we've seen, there's really only a few who are saved. And among these few, there are even fewer who are equipped to tell them. Now, sadly, I think we understand that... Uh, <clears throat> The Bible, I believe, does bear out that you can be a true believer and yet be confused about what the Lord actually says about salvation. It's very common today, even among believers, to, to think that the Bible teaches that you can be saved merely by believing the facts, that you don't have to actually trust Jesus Christ, you don't, you don't have to love Him. You don't have to be conformed to His image. You don't have to repent of your sins. All you have to do is believe the facts and you'll make it to heaven. Now, I do believe it's possible for a person to believe that and actually be saved as long as that person is actually trusting Jesus, loving Jesus, being conformed to His image, and repenting of their sins. <clears throat> I mean, sometimes you can be a victim of bad teaching and live better than what you believe. And of course, you know, these people who typically believe this do believe there are two classes of Christians, those who are disciples who actually take repentance and faith seriously and those who are just saved but aren't disciples who don't have to repent and so forth. Well, if they happen to move up into the disciple, you know, category, well, they're saved. But they might still be teaching other people they can be saved without being a disciple, without repenting and without believing. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, if you tell somebody that and you convince them they're on their way to heaven and they're not going to be condemned, you're actually leaving them in their condemnation and sin. They're still on their way to hell, but now they're convinced they're on their way to heaven. Well, that's the absolute worst condition that you could possibly leave anyone in to give them the assurance they're on their way to heaven when, as a matter of fact, they're on their way to hell. So even among those who may be genuine Christians... Those who have this kind of belief aren't qualified to bring the gospel to, to others because they're going to lead them astray. Now, among even, again, those who are saved, there are still fewer whose lives 
really measure up to what the Lord calls them to be. And we do need to realize that the message of the gospel needs to come in power as well as in truth. Your life, your love for others, your gentleness, your care and your concern speak more loudly, I think, than perhaps your message does. If you don't have genuine concern for the lost, then when you bring the gospel to them, it's not going to have much effect. And even among these, there are still fewer who are willing to take that message out to others. Uh, years ago, uh, and again, this may reflect what most churches are like, years ago, Don and I were part of a very large evangelical church that had at least 3,000 people that came on a regular basis. And yet, when it came time for prayer meetings, out of 3,000 people, we had about <clears throat> 60 who came. I haven't worked out the uh, statistics, but I don't think that's very many as far as percentage-wise. But when it came time for evangelism, even less showed up, maybe 30, maybe 40, maybe 50, which is a little over 1% of the total number of the congregation. And that's because, for one thing, there's only a few uh, among, well, there's only a few who are being saved, and again, perhaps the majority of those people didn't even know Jesus Christ. That is certainly possible. But even among those who do, there is a lack of spiritual maturity that is necessary to want to bring the gospel uh, to other people because you need to have a love that is going to be strong enough to minister to those who are like the ones Jesus ministered to those who are already bent against the gospel, those who are likely going to be antagonistic to what it is you have to say to them. You see, only those who have grown strong enough in God's love are going to have the strength that they need to be able to reach out to the lost, being willing to endure what you have to endure in order to do that. So there are many who need to hear the gospel, and yet there are very few who are equipped to reach them. And so what do you and I need to do? Well, finally, we need to do what Jesus told His disciples to do here. We need to pray. Pray that the Lord would raise up more workers. Pray that the Lord would use you, that He would equip you, that He would qualify you. Pray that through you, He would raise up many more workers to go into this harvest. Now, first of all, you need to pray that the Lord would use you to reach those who are perishing. Now, when was the last time that somebody you knew died and that person you know did not know the Lord? How did that make you feel when they died? What is it that went through your mind? Well, I'll tell you what goes through my mind when it happens to me. Why didn't I do more to help them find Jesus Christ while they were alive? Why didn't I pray more? Why didn't I reach out to them while there was still time? Why did I put it off? Or why did I not do it at all? Well, what did you learn from that experience? Well, the one thing that we all need to learn is this. We need to reach out to them with the gospel while they're still alive. We need to make sure that they've heard it we need to make sure that we're praying for them. But I also learned some things about myself, and I'm sure you learned this as well. You need to make sure that you know the Lord and that you believe that these things are true. You need to make sure that you know the truth and can effectively communicate it and that you're living a life that's consistent with that truth and that your love for your neighbor is strong enough to endure whatever you need to, whatever they might throw at you for telling them the truth. You need to become one who can share the gospel with others so that they might be saved. Now, I should mention, too, that unless this becomes a part of our lives, unless this becomes our purpose for living, we're never actually going to be able to attain what it is that we need to attain because this is something that we have to be doing all the time. <clears throat> this isn't something we sort of set aside certain times to do this. This needs to be our heart and our desire at all times. 
We need to not be afraid that other people might find out that we're believers or Christians, but we need to be afraid that they won't find out and that they won't hear the gospel. I mean, we need to realize that even if we witness to every single person that we knew and every person we had the opportunity to witness to throughout our entire lives, we would still reach so very few people. And yet there are so many who need to hear. We need to get the things out of our way that are in our way. You know, and it, there's likely many things that do seem to get in our way when it, when it comes to evangelizing. But I think they probably all really boil down to one, and that is if we are true believers, okay? If we're not believers, then the reason why we don't evangelize is because we really don't have the love of Christ in our hearts and we really don't care what happens to other people. But if we are true believers, we still have things that get in our way. And I think the number one thing is fear. The fear that you might offend somebody, the fear that you might lose a friend, the fear that they might get angry at you, the fear that you might not be accepted in your social circles and you might become an outcast. Well, I'll tell you what, if that happens to you, then you're in good company because the same thing happened to Jesus, same thing happened to His disciples, the same thing happened to everyone who ever followed Jesus Christ and Jesus told them ahead of time and He told us, He told you, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. If they called the head of the household the devil, how much more the members of his household. Maybe you're afraid that you're not going to do a good enough job and maybe you're going to spoil that person. He's not going to listen to anyone else again because you did such a poor job. You know, all these things are possible. People can get upset. You can become an outcast. Maybe you're not going to be, do it perfectly. That's certainly possible. But what will happen if you don't tell them? What happens if you don't try? What happens if they never hear the gospel? Well, they're going to perish. They're going to go down into hell. And they will be there forever. There's only going to be one intermission throughout all eternity of their suffering. And I wouldn't call it necessarily an intermission that is a pleasant one. And that is when they're taken out of hell to stand before God on judgment day. And then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's the only intermission the Bible speaks of to the suffering that goes on in hell. And they can be spared that if they simply hear the gospel and respond, but they're not going to respond if they don't hear it. They need to hear it, and they need to hear it from somebody who knows it. And we often don't tell them because we're afraid. So what is it that we can do to overcome this fear? Well, think about this for a minute. Have you ever shared the gospel with anyone in your whole life? Well, if you did, how did you overcome your inhibitions to do it then? How did you share the gospel then? Well, sometimes, you know, the Lord gives you clear opportunities. You know, things just kind of fall into place. The topic comes up. Somebody asks you what you believe. They started talking about religion. It just sort of naturally flowed into the conversation. You know, that happens. That's good. But what about times when it didn't come up? Have you ever press the issue? Have you ever told somebody who wasn't expecting it? It didn't just kind of open up and just flow naturally? Well, when you did that, where did you find the strength to do that? How did you do it then? Well, I think you probably found it in two places. First of all, in your love for the Lord, because you love Jesus Christ, because you love the Father, because you love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you know He calls you to actually tell other people the good news so that they can be saved. Maybe that was one of the main motivations, but I'll bet you that perhaps the most powerful one, and even though that other one should be the most powerful, this one often is, it's because of your love and your concern for that person, for that particular individual. Maybe it was your father, maybe it was your mother, or your brother, or your sister. Maybe it was a close friend. Maybe a neighbor. You cared so much about them and you, you know, the realization of hell was there and the danger they were in. You cared so much about them that you pushed through all the barriers, everything that gets in your way, all the concerns, all the fears, because you didn't want them to perish. 
In other words, your compassion for them overwhelmed you. It became stronger than your fear. Well, that's exactly what needs to happen, isn't it, to reach out to the lost. Your compassion needs to overcome your fear. Now, as Jesus went through these cities and villages and he saw the situation that the people were in, his heart was moved with compassion to reach out to them. That's what gives you the power to do precisely the same thing. If you want to be more effective in reaching others, you need a greater compassion, a greater concern, a greater love for the eternal well-being of those real people who are around you who really are going to go into hell if they don't repent and believe. If they don't hear the gospel, they can't. You need to have a love and compassion that goes beyond how they might respond, that looks beyond that to their need. What's going to happen to them if they don't trust Jesus? Do you care? You see, if you don't care, you're not going to do anything about it. You have to care, but that's what compassion is all about. It is caring about other people. We all need to care more. Now, again, let's not forget that they were no different than we are. I mean, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. We were heading to the same place. We were just as antagonistic toward the gospel as anybody else. But somebody shared the gospel with us, right? And the Lord used it to change our hearts. I mean, look at what He has done for you through the gospel. Can He not do the same thing to somebody else? Well, certainly He can do the same for them, and He will do it if they are His, his sheep. Again, we realize, we understand, you know, God's sovereignty and so forth. His sovereignty is not an excuse not to share the gospel. His sovereignty is the reason why we do share it because, yes, we know there are going to be people who aren't going to like it and are, are going to reject it, but God's sovereignty also tells us there are going to be people who actually will listen to it and will receive it just as we did. I mean, the reason why you receive Jesus Christ is because He worked in your heart by His Holy Spirit. He will do exactly the same thing for others, but He only does it through the gospel. Only somebody who knows the gospel, only somebody who has embraced it, somebody whose life is changed by it, can actually bring it to them. That's the kind of person that you and I need to be to bring the gospel to others. Now, there is just one more brief point here, and that's this. <clears throat> Even if we and every believer that, that is a believer today, a genuine believer, whether you know, they're equipped or not, did all in their power to reach mankind, to reach all those who don't know Jesus Christ, it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough. We need more workers. I mean, we're not enough. All the churches, even the mega churches, we don't have enough people. We need more people. So where are we going to find more people? Well, we need to pray, don't we? We need to pray that the Lord would raise them up. But how does the Lord raise them up? He raises them up by evangelism. He raises them up through us. Uh, we need more workers. We need to pray. But what, when we pray, we need to realize the way that God's going to answer this call is by using us to reach others with the gospel, to evangelize them and to make disciples so that they can also join us in this work. You know, I don't know how many times I read this passage where Jesus says, therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into His harvest. And I thought, okay, I'm going to pray that the Lord will raise up workers in all these different places, you know, and, and other people are going to do it. But what Jesus meant by this was not that, you know, you need to pray that He'll use somebody else, but you need to pray that He'll use you. And you need to pray that through your work, He would save and that people would be discipled and more people would be raised up and we would have more workers. We need, in other words, to look not for somebody else to do the work. We need to realize that it starts with us. We need to pray that the Lord would 
form Christ in us, would make us more like Jesus Christ, that we would have more of His heart. Remember, that's what His image is, His heart, that we would have more care and concern, that we would care what happens to people out there, even, even the hateful ones, even the ones that are most repulsive to us, you know, the ones that are the, the darkest sinners. Don't forget what you look like to God before He saved you. And apart from Jesus Christ, what you would continue to look like to Him. We are not beautiful to Him. We were not sterling. We were not just for the few spots. I mean, we were black and we were ugly and abominable. And yet the Lord had mercy on us. We need to look beyond the external. We need to look beyond what they are and see what they can be. But again, remember, it starts with us. The harvest is still plentiful. The laborers are still few. We need to pray to the Lord of the harvest that He would fill our hearts with compassion, with care and concern for the lost, that He would send us out to do this work and that He would give us success and that there would be more workers to carry out this work with us on earth so that there might be more voices to praise God not only on earth, but also in heaven. We need to pray that God would advance His work on earth. But again, it starts with compassion. So let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would work that heart in us, that He would give us that same love and compassion Jesus had for the lost and that we would begin thinking in, the, in that direction and moving towards bringing the gospel to other people regardless, again, of how they might respond. Let, let's, let's pray.